You're just joining us. My guest is with me right here at the table. He's Dark Boy uh partner. Let me say the way he wants to. <laughs> partner, Simeon Cooper's partners. Welcome to the program and thanks for joining me again. Morning. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Um, let's get started perhaps from the budget. You know, the president has presented the budget. He was applauded. Okay, he presented it quite early uh, despite the culture we have because we've been saying, okay, let's return the budget cycle from January to December. Hopefully that all this will be done and sorted before uh, we all go home for the holidays and all of that. But we'll be seeing MDAs, even ministers, coming to defend their budgets. Just speak to me about perhaps some of the things you've seen so far from the presentation of the budget from Mr. President till now. Well, we can see what will be called a notable improvement on even the presentation of the budget cycles. Hopefully, if the process is followed through, as you've said early enough, and we will be able to start our year properly. You will find from what has been presented thus far, the ministers that have gone to defend, there seems to be a general problem, is that there's not enough money to match the needs of even the government. Government is consistently spending so much on recurring expenses and is not able to invest in capital projects that can help to grow the economy ultimately. Uh, and what you find is that every year in, year out, s over 60% of the income is spent on paying salaries and maintaining overheads. Another 20% of it goes on servicing debt. So by the time the chips are down, the things that can help us increase revenue, which is to invest in infrastructure, becomes a problem. It has been noted that we have a definite problem with power. But how can we get the power to increase? We need to spend $100 billion every year or so, so that we can meet what is the expectation. All the money, even if government took all the revenue and income it made every year to put in power, it will not be enough to meet the needs that we need to put in. So th that creates a problem, is that how can we generate more money to meet the expectations? One way definitely is to cut and reduce expenses, losses, and a lot of it was lost through fraud as well. But government is doing a lot in that regard. There's a lot of talk. I, I was watching on news this morning that um, EFCC has recovered so much money. I think in, in the last four years of Magu's acting capacity, he has recovered almost a trillion dollars or so. And you see that all that is money that has been taken out of our system that could have been used to improve. Now, what can the government do to increase? Is to improve infrastructure. The roads are a major problem. If you look in Lagos, the traffic has been horrendous in the last couple of weeks. And the challenge has been firstly flooding, mm. bad roads. Even if the government wants to repair those roads, it has to do it during the dry season. Any attempt to repair it now will it will worsen the situation. But if people cannot get to their destinations, that means a lot more has to be done through telecommunication and internet. I was, look, I was reading recently that telecoms companies are making so much money, m increased revenue. Airtel increased their revenue by 22% or so in the first quarter of this year. But all this is money that is within. We are not getting money coming from outside yet. In the last three years or so, we had about f um, five billion dollars. Yeah, we're talking about FDI. FDI yeah, in foreign FDI direct is very investments. Low. Yeah. That is the only way we can really uh, expand our economy, because what we have now, if you look at all the oil revenue that we depend on, most of the money we come f comes from oil revenue. We make eighty dollars per barrel in the best case scenario. Mm, that's the best case. Best case scenario. <laughs> when last did oil. that happen? <laughs> We have 2 million barrels per day. Best case scenario, Best too. case scenario. How, how much does that come to for each person at the end of the day? So when you look at that vis-a-vis -vis the expenses we need to make, the money is just inadequate. The only other source of revenue that Nigeria has seen is direct remittances from Nigerians abroad. Mm. I was joking with someone yesterday. He said, what is Nigeria's biggest export? I said, human capital. 
That is the one that but gives us But that is it. It's not even, it's not even all, yes. It's not all. It's not all. We're getting more revenue yeah. from Nigerians in diaspora. diaspora. Spending, sending money yes. home. But one area that has been left fallow is in um, inter, uh, IT. We have a lot of brilliant Nigerians who can, who can design websites and make things happen in that industry. But unfortunately, the energy and the intelligence is being channeled into 419. If there's a way we can redirect mm. these energies and this intelligence into... Gen India has the largest economy based on IT income. But what are we doing about us? How can we redirect and rechannel this energy is one of the things I think this administration will do well. In After arresting these Yahoo Yahoo boys, what are we doing with them? Mm. How can we retrain them? These guys are obviously intelligent. If they can scam, uh, and I said before, if they can scam a white man who is sitting in America to believe that he can earn money he has not worked for in Nigeria, that means these guys have powers of persuasion. Can we redirect this energy into generating income for the country legitimately? Mm -hmm. Until we expand that income, we'll be running around in circles. I mean, all the money that we are fighting. I, I looked once at the budget of Brazil. Brazil has about 200 million, 210 million people. people yes. The budget, annual budget was about 22, 220 trillion. I broke 220 trillion dollars for the year. I looked at Nigeria's budget. Even look at this year's budget. We have 200 million people. The total budget we're talking about is about 20 trillion for all the states inclusive dollars. So all this money to service about the same number of people that Brazil is doing shows that we're far cry from where we're going. Mm, it's so, so I think we need to find new ideas. And one way that has been shown now is taxation. Mr. Fowler says over 19,000 companies evade tax every year. We have lost about 15, we lose about $15 billion every year to tax evasion. So the question is, how can we get more people within the tax bracket? My belief is that when more people come within the tax bracket, they will begin to ask government, what are you doing with the money? Hitherto, people have not been interested in what happens to their tax money. They'd rather not pay and say, well, I don't care what happens. But now if you, ta if you pay taxes, you'll be forced to ask government that, hey, this money you are taking from us, mm. what are you doing with it? And until we look at increasing tax revenues, we look at more foreign direct investments, we're looking at how we can do more with that in, um, technology and internet-based systems, we're not going to increase them. But I think if we look at those areas, then we'll get more money to develop our infrastructure. Then we can complain more about electricity when you pay for it. I think the time will come too when we have to face reality and increase uh, monies people are paying for power. Right now, when you look at people who are paying for power privately, they're doing it at a, an average rate of 50 Naira per kilowatt hour. Uh, Magodo is an example of that. Some people are not happy with it. Some are happy that they're now getting 24-hour power, but they've had to pay more. If you're generating power privately, you probably spend about 80 Naira per kilowatt hour when you put your own generator and inverter and what you're paying at 23 Naira or so to government. And you find that until we come to a right mix and right pricing, we will continue to have a lot of problems with our infrastructure and money. Yeah. So these are quick wins for you that we can, we can generate money from, isn't it? Yeah. These are just quick wins. These are just that quick things that we can do. What, what do you think of the 7.5% proposal for that? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Tough on the citizens or tough for the government getting it out from us? Both, both <laughs> ways. Both ways. I mean, <laughs> I, I know that when you travel abroad, though, yeah. we pay sometimes up to 12 or 17% percent on, on taxes on VAT in several countries which we are struggling to get back. But I'm not sure we have any system in which anybody can claim VAT back in Nigeria on things, on that easily you come and shop and shop on luxury items. But 7.5% is going to be tough, but it is needed. That is the only way we can increase revenue. Are we happy with it? Certainly not. Nobody is happy to pay taxes anyway. Mm. I mean, nobody really wants. But even if you look at your income, I have a brother that works in the UK. The more you earn, is the more you are taxed. Mm. 
people pay almost 50% in some cases of their income as taxes. No, but don't you see that that's why there's a difference between the UK and the United States? Because the U UK's economy somehow, the, you work more, we'll take it back from your taxes. But you see that the US is more like a liberal co uh, economy that is a bit flex and all of that. I think Donald Trump cut corporate taxes from 35% to 21 to like give leeway. And you see those companies bring out earnings now, hiring more people, the, the economy is booming and all of that. Which model do you think we should go for? You said, I, I think for corporate taxes in mm. Nigeria, corporations are doing well. I mean, look at the real corporations in Nigeria. They're declaring huge profits every year. It's a manufacturing se sector that is suffering, really. And that is based on power. A lot of them complain about infrastructure. Even if you have power, the roads to evacuate your goods are not there. Rails are being improved now, but until those things begin to function well, we cannot copy the model of um, Trump. It's going to be difficult. Trump has an economy that is working. I don't forget that before Trump came in, Obama had done a lot of taxation and things to improve the economy before Trump came in. So, mm. But, but, Trump but he, didn't, he didn't tax the poor, though. The poor, he, he did a lot of things to give rebates VAT to the poor. VAT is not a tax on the poor. Yes, I know, it's a it's consumption a, it's tax. A consumption yes, tax. yes. I'm just saying, we're not even talking about VAT because you see a lot of charges, at least in the last two months or so. Even the banks came up with their own. Oh, no, is it telecom? The USSD, I don't know if you got that, <laughs> if you got that message like I did. Four naira per 20 seconds. But uh, I was yeah. going to buy petrol at yeah. the station. I turned down to the and told me they now charge 50 naira. For, for using VAT. My, for my POS, for my POS, POS transaction. Service like, charge. I said, when did this come again? But I mean, so you see a lot of charges coming in, which are offensive sometimes. Yeah, but very offensive sometimes. Okay, let's see if we can uh, take a, a few comments coming through. In case uh, you want to contribute to the program, please feel free to do that. Uh, you can send us a tweet at uh, Moneyline AIT. You can also send me a tweet at Nancy. You know. All right. Um, what else should we do? You know, I saw something in the news that Nigeria is spending, I think, 150 billion naira on judgment debts. <laughs> what does that mean? You're a lawyer. <laughs> they take Nigeria to court, Abi. Yes. What Nigeria will pay the base. What you find is that there are several um, transactions that the government got into or the country got into. And they complain. And, I t and a typical example that comes to memory is a PNID, PNID. It's a recent thing. And what you find is a situation where government was supposed to enter, do something, they failed to do it, and the government is sued. Those judgments, when, when they go to court and get judgment, the government has to pay them. And that is a big chunk of our income that goes on those kind of damages as well. But you will find from what we see in the PNID case that many of those judgments are sometimes rigged, frivolous, uh, and a lot of times really fraudulent. Let's call it what it is. The PNID case is a, a good example of what a fraudulent thing is. The transaction was essentially between two private companies. Um, PNID wanted to treat Nigerian gas. Nigerian government says, if you have the gas, we'll buy it from you. But the gas was supposed to be supplied by ADAX and Mobil. Adax and Mobile say to PNID, we cannot give you that quantity of flared gas you require to meet your 150 million cubic, cubic feet per day. And for government, that is a frustrated contract. If you cannot give me the gas, that is the end of it. But they sued the Nigerian government for not buying the gas from them when they had never really built their own treatment plant. And they get a judgment against the Nigerian government. And they're holding the gun to the Nigerian government and say, we must pay. Now, if we didn't have a government that was ready to fight the case, it would have just become another debt we would have to pay. But because this administration said, we're not paying this money, let's find out what really went wrong. And you've, I've seen a bit of that happening. And that when, the government, when there's a judgment against government, I think it behoves on government to challenge every judgment that is pending against it. Most of the time, at high court level, the government agrees to pay. Mm. But why can't we go to Court of Appeal? There's a Supreme Court. And in every case, if all those judgments are tested, you will find that the government will be able to save a lot more money mm. in just testing and challenging. That, that is why we have the appellate courts. But quite a number of times, I know these foreigners have also found a way to compromise Nigerians. 
I was speaking at a conference in Germany and I told them that the, the greatest problem with Nigerian corruption is foreigners who come in. It's a foreigner that comes and says, okay, I'll give you $10, let him pay my $100. If there's nobody who's creating that avenue, well, Nigerians are ingenious. Are you we saying that foreigners do that more than Nigerians well, themselves? Yeah. They taught us corruption, really. They taught us, oh. they brought it in. They brought it in, without a doubt. Mm. I mean, yes, we have learned from them, but the major problem has been foreigners who come and offer these incentives. I mean, we know the, there's a Malabu case. The Malabu case is still fresh in our minds, that ongoing problem. Who are the main beneficiaries of? Who brought in the money to pay for the oil block, which you knew was revoked? But, you know, they brought in monies, paid for the block, and offered some Nigerians some money in the process, whichever way it goes. Without their own, I mean, if they come in to do business and do it clean, it will reduce it. But when you are competing, when a Nigerian business is competing against a foreigner who's bringing in money and offering officials of government or people who have the position to award the contract to them some money, then that becomes more incentive. Why should I give it to you who will do the same work for the same thing? I'd rather give a foreigner who would give me something and cover my tracks. Mm. How do you think then this issue of corruption should be dealt with? Since in your earlier session you did say EFCC of course said it has recovered some money, how should this issue of corruption be dealt with? Though you've, you've glossed over it a bit in terms of, um, even you talked about the Yahoo Yahoo sign syndrome that we're seeing right now, yeah. which I also like the interesting perspective which you brought in in terms of redirecting this Energies. And energies into something more productive. Are there other things we can do perhaps to curb uh, uh, corruption, especially in the public procurement kind of level, uh, that is in government, so to speak? Uh, unfortunately, I think the way the pro public procurement process is skewed, although it was initially designed to um, reduce corruption, it has of its own become a problem with corruption. Because when people want to do things and want to do it quickly, failing to meet or follow the procurement requirements becomes a crime on its own. It becomes an offense. And that has slowed down a lot of things that government can do and should be doing. I, they need to find a way to decentralize the procurement system. Because what happens now is that every contract goes to BPP for approval or clearance. And if there's, there's so much... Um, first of all, there, is there enough capacity in the BPP to assess every transaction that is brought to them? The Ministry of Mines and Power want to, Mines and Steel, want to do a contract to build a quarry or something. They have to go to BPP. The Water Resources wants to do something, they have to go to BPP. Ministry of Power want to buy a plant, they go to BPP. And how many people do you have in BPP that really understand the nature of those transactions. So sometimes you will find that there is a slowdown at the BPP while they are trying to get information or knowledge about it. Other times they just pass it or keep it because they cannot understand it. And you find that becomes a kind of bottleneck in government. So when you need to do some things quickly and you find an executive who is in a hurry to do things and says, look, go ahead and do this thing while you are sorting out the process. It becomes a problem for him. Mm. Okay. Well, just, as, just as we end the program, uh, what, what else do you really have to say in terms of perhaps some of the problems or challenges that we're having right now around, there's so many problems right now. Wh which would you want to <laughs> address as we close? Let me which, allow you. Which, which, where do we start from? Yeah. Is the problem? We're in a Cat 22 situation. situation. We, have, we have so many issues. The question is which one needs to be addressed first? Mm. And unless we address them one after the other, as you're addressing the issue of power, the gas companies are saying we're not being paid for gas. I, I would look at a situation where, first of all, we address power. Power has to be addressed holistically. There was, there's been an attempt to sell the power companies so that the private sector may run it. And I think we just have to get into more private sector doing it. Sometimes it may seem wrong, it may seem horrid, but it is better to just privatize. And the more things we can privatize and leave in the hands of Nigerian companies running them and monitor them and regulate them, have regular checks on them by EFCC, make sure the, oh, the court system is a major problem. Until the judiciary and we have government working as one entity, 
what you find now is that the executive works as an executive, legislature works as legislature, judiciary work in their own silo. We have to find a way, the government has to find a way to work together. Because what we're taught yeah. is that legislature, judiciary and executive government. make government. government yes. But now executives say judiciary yeah. is not supporting yeah. them. Judiciary is look at them as different entities. And so they have to find a way yeah. to work together as a body. Maybe call a collaboration meeting and look at this. That what do we really want mm -hmm. to achieve? So that we are not working at cross purposes with ourselves. Cross but until ourselves. we have those three arms working together, we'll be running around in circles. Okay. I think on that note, let's leave it today. Well, at least we're not running around in circles. <laughs> 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 You've been able to at least bring in some perspectives. So many thanks for joining me on today's edition of the program. My pleasure. And I wish you a safe trip back to Lagos. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for coming. All right, I've been uh, speaking with Dakwa Kiyashun, who is a partner, Simeon Cooper's partners. Uh, we've been looking at issues around the 2020 budget and perhaps some of the quick wins that we need to uh, uh, do to get uh, money from. That's the much we can take for today and of course this week. Thank you for investing your time uh, with us so far. Uh, so good. It was nice knowing that you're there with us.